to come together and explore Jesus with you. Hey, thank you for being here. Honored to have you. I'm kind of waiting awkwardly because I'm going to sit down and use your chair in a minute. I guess I need a place to put my stuff, my things here. Sorry, Philip, if that gets in your way. All right. All right, I want you guys to remember this equation. Think of this as, as like a mathematical equation, okay? Sorry, I don't have a slide. And you know what, man? If somebody started off a conversation with me, a lot of times people start off conversations with me being apologetic. So let me apologize for starting off this conversation with being apologetic. Scratch that. All right, equation, mathematical equation. Remember this with me. Obedience over opposition equals blessing. Can you picture that on a chalkboard? Picture a chalkboard or a whiteboard, I guess. Old school. We chalk, right? Blackboard. Um, Obedience over, draw a line if you're taking notes, opposition equals blessing. Got it? Okay. We are going uh, to look at a time and explore uh, four different writings in, a, in, in like the second to smallest book of the Old Testament. So I think Obadiah is the smallest that Charles talked about a month or so ago, and now we're going to look at Haggai today. Uh, we only got a few prophets left, man. We're coming down to the end. We're going to close, uh, close this thing out uh, with the Old Testament uh, in a few weeks when I get back from vacation. I'm still going to be here next week, but um, we got Haggai. And Haggai is a, is a time and a period where, if you remember, uh, God created his people, established a relationship with them. They went into slavery. Exodus, he got them out, um, and, and he led them into his promised land. And, and things didn't quite go really well in the promised land, so, and, and, and God's people didn't honor him in the promised land, and they divided into two kingdoms, and both of those kingdoms were taken into exile, first by the Assyrians, then by the Babylonians. Okay? And, and the southern kingdom is where Jerusalem, God's holy city, was, or is, right? And when that community or nation was taken into exile, the temple was destroyed. Then the Persian Empire raised, is raised up, conquers the Babylonians, and allows a remnant, like we talked about last week, right? We talked about a remnant. Allows that remnant to go back in to the promised land and rebuild the city of David, to rebuild the holy city and the temple, okay? <clears throat> now, last week, we talked about that remnant is the one that goes to be in there uh, and, and to rebuild the city, this is, a, this is the story of Ezra and Nehemiah that we talked about several months back. Uh, and last week we talked about how that remnant is called to preserve, right? And to be salt and light into, in this lost world. But it's not just called to preserve, it's called with great purpose. And in this moment, the remnant was called to rebuild God's temple. And so they go into this temple or they go back into the city of Jerusalem, they start to, to um, they, they begin by being obedient to God's call and purpose to rebuild the temple. But the neighbors don't like what they build it. And then the neighbors start to throw a fit. And the, and the neighbors don't like the, the new projects that are going on. And so they complete the foundation of the temple and then they start to face some opposition and what these what the israelites do god's people who were given the purpose to go back and rebuild the temple in the holy city when they start to experience opposition they shrink back in disobedience But obedience over opposition equals blessing. So that means that opposition over obedience equals 
no blessing. Withholding of blessing, right? Um, I believe that it's very human what they did. Self-preservation. When opposition comes, when opposition comes into our, you know, into our life and into our world, it is very natural for us as humans to go into self-preservation. And so what happens with the Israelites is, and this is just context, we're going to read most of Haggai here in a minute. Um, what happens to the Israelites is they shrink back into self-preservation so much that they stop building God's temple. And they just start taking care of themselves. They become the priority. They, instead of Jerusalem being a uh, Christ-centered community, it becomes a self-centered community. And they all start taking care of their houses and building their houses and their, their barriers and boundaries of protection. And they neglect and put to the back burner God's mission and purpose for their lives. Tracking with me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so God sends, God sends a, uh, a prophet, Haggai. And there's a few collect this. It's not just a, a, a centered around one person, this leadership effort, man. We've got um, Ezra and Nehemiah during this time. Uh, eventually, Nehemiah builds the walls. We've got um, Zerubbabel, uh, who's really the governor that... that um, that revitalizes the people, okay? And then there's uh, Joshua, the, Joshua the high priest as well. So there's a collection of, of called and gifted um, people that God, we're going to see God stirs their hearts and encourages them through Haggai to say, hey man, I'm with you. Don't give up on your efforts. <clears throat> uh, I've been reading in, in Acts lately and... Uh, what, 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 back in the day, what they did and Jesus did, you see this through the Gospels, Jesus, you see this with, with Paul. Um, when they gathered together at the synagogue on their, their campus, this was their gathering place. Like, um, they weren't there for an hour, hour and 15. Okay? And I'm not suggesting that we stay here all day. Uh, but I just love the communal atmosphere that they had they got together they prayed they worshiped they did not have microphones they for sure did not have um, flat screen tvs uh, they they got together shared community worshiped jesus opened the scriptures and reasoned amongst each other and if somebody had a word they shared that word so so we're, that's what we're going to do um they read the scriptures and then often the teacher uh in that moment would sit down. Um, I'm going to read. Haggai, where are you? Zephaniah, bam. Haggai, there we are. It's a small one. It's hard to find. <clears throat> I'm going to read most of this short book. If you listen to it on your Bible app, I think it only takes about seven minutes. Me, it probably takes a little bit longer. Um, so I'm going to read most of this, and I think I may throw in a few verses that, uh, that you guys don't have in the back. So, you know, guys, bring your Bibles, man. Follow along with me. I use the NASB. Uh, I may switch that up um, sometime next year when we go through the whole Bible, finish the New Testament. But I use the New American Standard Bible translation. That's what we put up here. But if you're following along and yours is different, follow along as best you can, Okay. So we're in the book of Haggai. In the second year of Darius the king, that's, that's the uh, king of Persia, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Remember I said Zerubbabel was a governor. And to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, the time has not come. 
even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Yeah, that's what the people are saying. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, it is time for you yourselves to dwell, excuse me, it is time, excuse me, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house, while this house lies desolate? He's saying, are you really going to just lie up in your nice houses while we just got the foundation of an unfinished project being laid here? For real? That's how we're going to do the house of the Lord? That's how we're going to treat his mission and purpose that he gave us? That's how we're going to do it? We're just going to live these self-centered lives and forget about Christ at the center and what he's called us to? Okay. Um, <clears throat> verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Take inventory of your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. Think about it. Consider your ways. Opposition came. You've been disobedient. And now what's the result? It says, you have sown much, but ha harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earn wages, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Put your finger right there. If you're quick with your Bible, go to Proverbs 11. If you're not, don't worry about it, just listen. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. It says, there is one... Well, I'll let you get there if you're going. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. It says, there is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Like That's very counterintuitive to the laws of humanity, <clears throat> but when it comes to kingdom principle, this is how it works. Oh, you try to self-preserve? Yeah, you just... It, it, you, you're going to run out. But if you're generous, oh, it's going to come right back. You're sowing seeds. You're putting it out. You water, oh, you're going to be watered. You sow, oh, you're going to be blessed. Right? You put prioritize God and his mission and his purpose, oh, you're going to be all right. But when we, when we function out of scarcity, when we function out of um, fear, And we try to hold on tight. That's when we're left. Man, look, the result is, this is why you're not blessed. This is why you're not, God's saying to these people, he's saying, look, you're not blessed because you don't have my best interest at heart. You're out here living for yourself. Well, go ahead, take care of yourself then. You see why your purses are empty. You see why, um, <clears throat> why you're, you're cold and don't have nothing, enough to drink. You're not being blessed because in your opposition, you chose to be disobedient, and now you're not receiving my blessing. Um, let's keep going. Uh, back to Haggai. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified. I love that. Consider your ways. Man, that's a call to reflection, isn't it? Consider your ways. Take a, look about, take a look at how you're going through life. Is God prioritized or are you the priority? <clears throat> uh, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but, well, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the, Lord, declares, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its due. Because of you, the sky has held, withheld its due. And the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, 
on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the, the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all, your labor, on all the labor of your hands. Man, who said the Old Testament was boring? This is so good and so applicable. Verse, verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, what they do? Obeyed. Then the remnant obeyed <clears throat> the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Je Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of, the, of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. I want to read these, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through nine, one through 8, I don't think we'll have on the screen. So just uh, follow along with me as best you can. On the 21st day, on the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of all the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its formal, former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? What he's saying is, Hey, there's some people among you that had seen, because they were gone for, I think, about 70 years. There's some there, there are some people among you that when you were kids, you've got memories, vivid memories of being in the temple and its glory. This was Solomon's temple that he built. And y'all are looking at what's being built now, and you're like, oh, this isn't what I remember. This isn't how church is supposed to be. I don't like this. It looks different. But then you've got some other people that are part of this new building project. We're like, look what, we're, look what God is using us to do right? That doesn't sound like church folks today, does it? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord in verse 4. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land. Take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made, made you when you came out of Egypt, back when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations. And I will fill, I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And, this, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Verse 10. On the 24th day, excuse me, on the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. This is, I think, his third, um, his third prophecy, uh, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Ask now the priest for a ruling. Get this. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? What he's saying is, if a man is carrying something holy and touches something else, will that thing become holy? No, they say. Then Haggai said, if one, of, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches anything else, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. 
I think I'm going to stop right there. <clears throat> oh, we got a couple more minutes. Uh, I, man, I heard, I remember in, in, in old school church, they, used to, they, they say, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a lot. That's a lot right here. Um, so these people shrink back in, in disobedience when the opposition comes, and God sends Haggai to stir them up and says, guys, you let God's mission slip to the back burner. You've become about your agenda. You've become, you've become the priority and, he, and he, he reminds them, don't forget, don't forget about me and my mission and from where the blessing comes. I brought you here with purpose. Now, <clears throat> uh, it's a little intimidating to talk about this because the tendency and the, the, the temptation is to, to bait, bait and hook people into, you got to be about church more. See, God's about church. no. He gave them a purpose and a mission. Our purpose and mission looks a little bit different now, right? So it's not just about getting us to come back to church and building up this place. That's not what this is. This is about being the church and his mission. And what's the mission that God has given us? What's the mission he gave us? What's our mission as a church? To be disciples and make more disciples. And if we're not reminded of that, then we'll forget. And when we face opposition... We shrink back in disobedience. And then God sends prophets to say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You're starting to live this self-centered life, and I'm not the priority anymore? Nah, we, we got to make some adjustments. <clears throat> um, but I love the encouragement. Hey, take courage. I'm with you. But it doesn't look the same as it used. Not the glory of what God is doing in the church is going to far exceed the glory of what you've seen and witnessed and experienced before. Yeah, it looks different. Behold, I'm doing a new thing and I'm excited about it, God says. <clears throat> um, yeah, the remnant obeyed, man. They weren't just there to be salt and light. They were there with purpose. And I love that he stirs up the hearts of the leaders. He stirs up the the community of the remnant and they start building and then they shrink back a little bit again and then he encourages them again and then he calls them out um, on, on their hearts. So being obedient um, means living for God's mission. Being obedient in this context means being obedient to God's mission and it means prioritizing him and putting him first. And if we're not doing that, and we're just going through the religious acts and the religious motions of life, of, 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 of Christianity, American Christianity, uh, God sends the prophet to tell us how he feels about it. <clears throat> um, and he shares this interesting this this interesting story, right? If you're holding something holy, does that thing become holy? No. But if you are in sin or disobedient, does that thing that you touch now become unclean? Yeah, it does. Sin is contagious. Obedience, not so much. Righteousness, not so much. Obedience and righteousness is not as it's, we're, people don't get excited about obedience. Oh man, that guy's just so be, obedient. I want to be obedient. No, that's why bars are packed uh, on on Saturday night, but churches, church campuses be empty, not not popping, not jumping. Sin goes viral. Obedience to God's will that takes effort. That ain't easy. Obedience takes effort. Disobedience um, 
withholds God's blessing. Obedience releases God's blessing. But obedience takes effort. Not everybody wants that life, man. When <clears throat> um, People catch viruses, don't they? People catch COVID. People don't catch obedience like a virus. They don't stick like that. Um, <clears throat> it, it, uh, when I read this, I was reminded of a great analogy. Is if you're if you're wearing a white if you're wearing white gloves and you're taking off those gloves and one of those gloves falls in the mud. Does anything happen to the mud? No. I remember hearing this years ago. I was like, man, this is great. This is brilliant. Nothing happens to the mud, does it? The mud, the, what happens to the what happens to the glove? It becomes muddy, right? But no one says the mud becomes glovey. <laughs> right? That's what sin and disobedience does. In, in community, it impacts and affects the blessing that God desires to bring forth. But the way God works in this world, if you are obedient, he desires to bless. If you are obedient, you're going to be blessed. But if when opposition comes, you shrink back. Or if you don't prioritize him and you think, oh, I'm still going to be blessed as long as I do the right things. No, no, no. That's not how it works. <clears throat> Oh man, I, I recently saw even a, a grotesque example of the same analogy. You guys, you guys in the mood? Can you guys handle some gross? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I was going into to Albertsons, and I heard the sound of someone coming behind me blowing a snot rocket. You know, a snot rocket. I'm telling you, it's gross. I told you ahead ahead of time. Blowing a snot rocket. <laughs> As they're walking into Albertsons. Like on the ramp in. At, behind me. And I'm like, is this guy blowing a snot rocket? <laughs> and then does one of these. Kind of wipes it on. <sighs> And then goes over and like, I, he didn't even get a cart, but he touched the carts. Like he was going to get one. He's like, I don't know. He decided he didn't need a cart now. I was so appalled. I was like, yo, I don't ever want to use a shopping cart. I actually don't ever want to buy anything from the store. I'm going to become a farmer. <laughs> right? And it doesn't matter what I touch in that place. It's not becoming clean. In my mind, everything is now unclean. Right? That is so disgusting. That that's one of the most disgusting things I've seen in a long time. Second to God's people being disobedient. And holding back, the, holding back the blessing that he desires to bring on community. Man. And so, I don't, man, I don't like... I already told you, when it comes to opposition, I have a, like, I have a tendency, to, I have a tendency to shrink back. A tendency to shrink, shrink back. But then God stirs something up in my heart. I got to press forward. I got to press forward in the, heart, in the heart because opposition is not an excuse to be disobedient. Right? And so God's called us to be obedient as, pe as his people. Um. Jesus says it like this. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then everything you're worrying about is going to be taken care of. Be obedient to abiding in me, seeking my will, being obedient to my will, doing the mission and purpose that I've given you, and everything else is going to be taken care of. It's very against the grain of society, but very with the grain of the kingdom. This 
just do a little bit more Bible study and be done. <clears throat> The awesome thing about God is, man, he blesses. And here's the thing. It's not like we're not, God doesn't need to convince us to be obedient. It's like, guys, I'm going to bless you. Just be obedient. No, he has blessed. So therefore, from a blessed state, we should be obedient. We already are blessed and receive the blessing. It's the blessing that he promised back in the day. So if you go to verse 20, this is the last prophecy of, of uh, Haggai. He says, Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to, Zer- speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders will go down. Every everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel. Who's Zerubbabel? He's the governor. Son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring. Signet ring is the seal and the promise of the message that has been sent. It's the, it's the sign of authority from the king. That's, and he's saying, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, it's an encouragement to Zerubbabel to keep leading well. It's an encouragement to, to his people to know that, man, this is in line with God's will. But it's also messianic prophecy. Man, the Bible's fun, dude. Study this thing, man. Study this word. Go to Flip over to Matthew. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm so tempted to skip over genealogies when I read the list of names, one after another, when I read the Bible. It's like, man, all right, I'm going to read the Bible, I'm going to start off, and then you're just going to list names? Yeah, these are important names. If you go to Matthew, verse 12, it says, After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel. Who was Zerubbabel's dad? Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. It's through his line that we get Jesus, the prophesied Messiah. So Jesus isn't like dangling the carrot of, I'm going to bless you. Just be obedient. You can do it. Take another step of faith. Come on, kids. No, he's already blessed us. We already have Jesus. We already have all that we need in him. We are crazy, crazy to walk around disobedient. We already have the blessing of the Christ, man. We already have the promised blessing. And then obedient or opposition comes and we shrink back. No, no, no. We're already more than conquerors. We already have the promise. It's already signed, sealed, and delivered with the signet ring of the Holy Spirit within us. Press forward in obedience. And anticipate the blessing. Ah. Uh. Let's just sit with the Lord in a quiet moment. Lord, I, I, don't, I don't know what this message means to each individual, but I, I know what this message means to me to take courage, to press forward in obedience. To to come before you and consider my ways. To take inventory of how I walk this life and how can I, Spirit, how do you want to sanctify me to be more reflective of a piece of the remnant that you've called me to be? Holy Spirit, I trust your voice 
to the hearts and the minds of everybody in this room, Lord. Thank you for your whisper to us. Thank you for sending your prophets to rebuke and encourage us. Thank you for how your prophets that spoke years ago can miraculously have a voice that speaks to us in this moment of opposition, in this moment of struggle, in this moment where we're te tempted to be uh, self-preserving, in this moment when we're tempted to shrink back, in this moment when we're tempted towards bis disobedience, Thank you that, that your Holy Spirit that spoke to the prophets still speaks to us now. Take courage. Take inventory. Be obedient. Thank you for making us clean through the blood of Jesus. God, thank you for the reminder that if there's anyone's face that we're thinking of when we think about the opposition, God, thank you for the reminder that we don't, we aren't in opposition with flesh and blood. We don't battle with flesh and blood. And if we are, then we are being disobedient. Thank you that we are more than conquerors. Help us to press forward in obedience to you. And God, if there's any any clear sin, God, would you give us the courage to confess that, to acknowledge that? And would you surround us with aid in the midst of community to confront it and move past it and through it? Would, would you heal us from it? Would you deliver us from it? And Father, and, and as we consider our ways, would you reveal, like, this, like, our, like your son David prayed, Reveal any wicked way within us, Lord, and lead us in the way of righteousness because we don't want to touch things and make it unclean. We want to walk in obedience that will lead to blessing, blessing your name, blessing your kingdom, and, and, and blessing our, our community of believers and God paving the way for others to follow you with us. Thank you for this, this uh, opportunity to gather this morning. Thank you for the blessing of great worship leaders. Thank you for the, the presence and the gifting of everybody here with us. Would you, this is your day, Lord. This is your Sabbath day. Would you continue to bless it and make it holy? Not just this worship gathering moment, but would you just bless this to be a restful day for my brothers and sisters? for my friends. Would you bless this to be a day of rest? Holy. When I think of Sabbath, I'm remembering that that, that means to stop. Would we stop worrying? Would we stop the sin? Would we stop the disobedience and just rest in the promise of your goodness and salvation? Thank you, Jesus. In your name, I, uh, we pray. Amen. Um, we're good on reflection. I think that was reflective. Um, <clears throat> I hope that doesn't interfere. I'm sure you had something sweet on deck, man. You you was probably ready to rock. With praise God. So we're on the same same page. I'm gonna give some announcements, and, and we're gonna we're gonna get out of out of this moment. Okay. Uh, if we don't have your information, we would love to have it and just connect with you. And um, so please. Fill out a connect card somewhere in the back, and then uh, you can put it in the offering box. And speaking of offering box, uh, most of you guys don't use it. That's not <laughs> just just the old school folks. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But what we do have is this QR code right there, and so you can uh, take out your phones, and um, uh, yeah, you just take your camera and take a picture. Um, <clears throat> 
we, we don't use that as a manipulative opportunity to get you to give. If you're a guest, like I always say, there's no pressure. Um, but I promise, God promised, you will be blessed for your generosity. Um, and, and yeah. Uh, if you want to connect with us on, on social media, we got YouTube um, where you can you know, check out the services when you miss or, um, or if you just want to you know, go back and check out what, you know, what we talked about. Uh, you can go on YouTube, Christ Community Church. And then if you, uh, a big portion of how we do community life is through our sports program. And you can um, stay in the loop at Church Sports uh, on Instagram, at Church Sports. Another announcement is, uh, if you took a baby bottle to support Open Arms Pregnancy Resource Center, um, then please bring those back so we can get those in. If you put, you know, don't, a lot of us don't use cash anymore, obviously, like we just talked about. Um, you can just put a check in one of those bad boys, or you can put whatever you want uh, as, to support open arms. You can put in those bottles and bring them back. We'll make sure that they get to them. Uh, campus workday next Saturday, the 15th, from 7 to 10. Um, so the fun thing is about what we just talked about is, yeah, man, we do have this property that God has called us to steward, right? And, and so um, if you're somebody that likes to work with your hands and you want to just give, it, there's tons of projects that need to be worked on here. So um, come join us here on campus uh, next Saturday, 7 to 10. And then last announcement is, um, man, we're so honored to have Omega Sci-Fi, a local chapter, meet monthly on our campus. Charles is, is a part of that group. And uh, just love these guys, man. They, they've been um, working on putting together a blood drive. So if you would like to um, give blood, see Charles. The blood drive is on Saturday, July 29th from 9 to 5. It's going to be here. Um, actually, it's going to be in the sanctuary. Yeah, it's going to be in the sanctuary, right? So we will be in here on, on the 29th um, from 9 to 5 to give blood. Sound good? We need to get at least 40 people. That's not just from this community, but you know we want to we want to be supportive with that. Um, hey, that being said, man, uh, remember obedience. I always want to say opposition. That's the other way around. Obedience over opposition equals blessing. Love y'all. Have a great day. Oh, but now you're not up here to play some music. Shoot, cue something in the back. Cue something for the in the back for the smooth dismissal. <laughs>